Hi, I'm Levi Doherty, and I'm the publisher of the Kingmaker magazine, which is a black history magazine that talks about how to reveal the lost pages of history. I'm happy to be here today talking to a great uh, humanitarian and congressman who have given his life primarily helping others to be better and to make this world a better place. None other than Joseph J. Diaguati, who has come here today. I'm so grateful that you could meet. I'm uh, happy to be here. Thank you. I'm so inspired by what you've been doing. I've been reading on the work that you've done, especially uh, getting the Congressional Medal of Honor to, uh, to African Americans who have long passed on, but did great work in the World War II. Could you share a little bit about that? Well, you know, sometimes you're moved by stories you hear. And a, an African American historian, Leroy Ramsey, lived in my district, and he wrote a letter to the 34 congressmen and congresswomen New York State, that was the delegation about 30 years ago. Since then, by the way, we've lost five Congress uh, uh, representatives, so we're down to 29. And uh, I was amazed to find out that when I responded to him that I was interested in learning more about this, when he presented the case for Sergeant Henry Johnson, World War I, who was part of the 369th, which was an African-American division, which was in World War I, believe it or not, assigned to France, but didn't, they didn't serve under US generals, they served under French generals. This was the problem with segregation. You know, I'm originally from the Bronx. What do I know about black American history? I, I probably didn't know enough about Italian American, and my father was also Albanian, and I didn't know enough about that, uh, because my parents were immigrants. They came here with very little education. My dad had a fourth grade education, my mom had an eighth grade, eighth grade education. Thank God they, they worked hard in that grocery store in the Bronx. I had to work there too. And they managed to give me a very good education. But I didn't go to Congress with this kind of historical background that in the first part of the 20th century, which contained two of the most incredible events of that century, World War I and World War II, we had segregated divisions. I didn't know that. It wasn't in my history book at the St. Martin of Tours or at Fordham Prep. And then I found out, because of Dr. Ramsey, that it was Truman that did away with segregation. So as I looked into this, and I'm a certified public accountant, uh, I had to tell my staff, you know, you don't have to be an accountant to smell this, that this is wrong. Something stinks here. How can a million, 550,000 black Americans, African Americans serve and not one, not one, get the nation's highest award in those two wars when I knew they had gotten the Congressional Medal of Honor in the Civil War, Spanish-American War, Vietnam, and Korea. Well, I guess the answer is now more simple than I thought. It was racism. And when I brought the issue up, the national columnist, Bill Raspberry, did a big story, and I think you may have it in the papers that I sent you. And, uh, he liked the quote I gave at the end because he said, well, what's preventing us from doing this, Joe? I said, would you believe, Bill, that there are statutes of limitations and there's a five-year statute? In other words, if someone is recommended and, you know, is, and, it, and they say no, after five years, there's no going back. Right. And I said, Bill, you know, I was a, a tax partner at Arthur Anderson, and I know something about statutes of limitations, but you know what my feeling is about that? Statutes of limitations are for criminals, not war heroes. Mm. And he loved that line, he put it in the article. And in a, fa in a way, it's true. Why can't we open the statute of limitations with a bill in Congress? So I introduced two bills with Mickey Leland. Now, Mickey Leland was an African-American congressman from uh, Houston. Now, you might say, well, how did I get to know Mickey? Well, would you believe that I'm a fiscal conservative Republican a pro-life Catholic elected in one of the most liberal democratic districts in America, the lower part of Westchester County. And I ended up getting the largest African American population of any Republican in America. And I decided I was gonna serve them. And, and one of the things I decided to do to show that I was honest about saying that was to pursue this story. And what I found out 
was that there was discrimination and racism. The military wouldn't admit to it. But my persistence paid off when after getting over 150 signatures of congressmen, both sides of the aisle, the Secretary of Defense called me to say, Joe, I know you and Mickey are doing this. I know the military is not inclined to do it, but since you seem to be going after this and you're not gonna quit, I, I wanna tell you that you may not be doing the right thing by getting the 218 signatures you need to issue these medals because there may be other African Americans that deserve it more or at least as much as the two you picked. So he went to his office with Mickey Leland and the answer was a study in which they would look at every African American who got the second highest award in both World War I, World War II, and in the Navy in World War II because we had black Americans serving in the Navy, but guess where they were serving? In the kitchens. In the kitchens. That's right. And we had one, Dory Miller, that came out of the kitchen because his commanding officer was mortally wounded by Japanese Zeros, right. and he took the gun and shot down for them. Now they have a battleship named after him, they gave him the second highest award, and he even served in another ship afterwards and died before the end of the war, but they refused to give him the Congressional Medal of Honor. I'm still working on that one in Mickey's name. By the way, Mickey Leland, on a humanitarian mission to Africa, Ethiopia, with food, died in a plane crash. Amazing. So I had to carry this forward myself. When I uh, left Congress in 1988, I continued to do this work, and in 1991, President Bush found a good reason to issue the first one to Corporal Freddie Stowers, but this is still unfinished business. That's a wonderful segue into our video that we can watch right now. Thank you very much. Let's go to our video. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States and Mrs. Bush. Carl. Well, welcome to the White House and I salute the Vice President, Mrs. Quayle, and Secretary Cheney, other members of our cabinet, and General Vono, and distinguished members of Congress who are with us today, and uh, former Congressman Joe Diagardi. I'm especially glad uh, Joe's with us here today. To the former Medal of Honor re recipients, I salute each and every one of you. Uh, to Georgina Palmer and Mary Bowens, the sisters of today's honoree, are with us. And don't they look lovely? We're just delighted. And the honorees, some note of more than trivial passing. Uh, the honoree's great-grandnephew uh, Staff Sergeant Douglas Warren of the 101st Airborne, he returned, uh, he looks a little jet lagged to me, but he returned just last night from Saudi Arabia. And uh, I want to welcome you home. And we also, so to do equal time to the Air Force, why uh, we salute you, Mr. Stowers, also back here. He's at Langley. So it's a lovely day here, and we welcome each and every one of you to the White House. Um, we want to honor a true hero, a man who makes us proud of our heritage as Americans, a man who, in life and death, uh, helped keep America free. I speak of Corporal Freddie Stowers, to whom, posthumously, we present our highest military award for valor, the Medal of Honor. It's an award for bravery and conscience at Compendium 
uh, we call character. Today, Corporal Freddy Starrs becomes the first black soldier honored with a Medal of Honor from World War I. He sought and helped achieve the triumph of, a, of right over wrong. He showed, as this year has proved again, that an inspired human heart can surmount bayonets and barbed wire. Seventy-three years ago, the corporal first was recommended for a Medal of Honor, but his award was not acted upon. In 1987, then Congressman Joe Diogardi and uh, my friend, the late Mickey Leland, known to many here from Houston, discovered the Stowers case while conducting other research. And the Army took up the case. And last November, the secretaries of the Army and Defense recommended that Corporal Stowers receive the Medal of Honor. I heard his story, accepted their recommendation enthusiastically. It's been said that the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge. On September 28, 1918, Corporal Freddy Stowers took, stood poised on the edge of such a challenge and summoned his mettle and his courage. He and the men of Company C, 371st Infantry Regiment, began their attack on Hill 188 in the champagne meuse sector of France. Only a few minutes after the fighting began, the enemy stopped firing, and enemy troops uh, climbed out uh, of their trenches onto the parapets of the trenches, held up their arms, and seemed to surrender. The relieved American forces held their fire, stepped out into the open. As our troops moved forward, the enemy jumped back into their trenches and sprayed our men with a vicious stream of machine gun and mortar fire. The assault annihilated well over 50% of Company C, and in the midst of this bloody chaos, Corporal Stars took charge and bravely led his men forward, destroying their foes. Although he was mortally wounded during the attack, Freddy Stars continued to press forward urging his men on until he died. On that September day, Corporal Stars was alone, far from family and home. He had to be scared his friends died at his side, but he vanquished his fear and fought not for glory, but for a cause larger than himself, the cause of liberty. Today, as we pay tribute to this great soldier, our thoughts continue to be with the men and women of all our wars who valiantly carried the banner of freedom into battle. They, too, know America would not be the land of the free if it were not also the home of the brave. The soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, Coast Guardsmen of Desert Storm, a group that includes uh, uh, Staff Sergeant Warren, all these valiant Americans are heirs to the legacy of Corporal Stowers and the men, men of Company C. No nation could be more proud of its sons and daughters than we are of them. Today, we celebrate their achievements, but we also heed these words echoing over the centuries. Only the dead have seen the end of war. We owe it to Freddie Stowers and those who revere his legacy to defend the principles for which he died and for which our great country stands. In that spirit, I am honored to welcome two of his sisters, uh, Georgina Palmer of Richmond, California, and Mary Bowens of Greenville, South Carolina. They will accept the award on behalf of their late brother, the text of which I will now uh, ask uh, Sergeant, uh, Sergeant Major Byrne to read the citation. The President of the United States of America Authorized by Act of Congress, March 3rd, 1863, awards in the name of the Congress the Medal of Honor posthumously to Corporal Freddy Stowers, United States Army, for conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty. Corporal Freddy Stowers distinguished himself by exceptional heroism on 28 September 1918 while serving as a squad leader in Company C. 371st Infantry Regiment, 93rd Infantry Division, 
His company was the lead company during the attack on Hill 188, Champagne Marne sector, France, during World War I. A few minutes after the attack began, the enemy ceased firing and began climbing up onto the parapets of the trenches, holding up their arms as if wishing to surrender. The enemy's actions caused the American forces to cease fire and to come out into the open. As the company started towards and when within about 100 meters of the trench line, the enemy jumped back into their trenches and greeted Corporal Stower's company with interlocking bands of machine gun fire and mortar fire, causing well over 50% casualties. Faced with incredible enemy resistance, Corporal Stowers took charge, setting such a courageous example of personal bravery and leadership that he inspired his men to follow him in the attack. With extraordinary heroism and complete disregard of personal danger under devastating fire, he crawled forward, leading his company towards an enemy machine gun nest, which was causing heavy, heavy casualties to his company. After fierce fighting, the machine gun position was destroyed and the enemy soldiers were killed. Displaying great courage and intrepidity, Corporal Stowers continued to press the attack against a determined enemy. While crawling forward and urging his men to continue the attack on a second trench line, he was gravely wounded by machine gun fire. Although Corporal Stowers was mortally wounded, he pressed forward, urging on the members of his squad until he died. Inspired by the heroism and display of bravery of Corporal Stowers, his company continued the attack against incredible odds, contributing to the capture of Hill 188 and causing heavy enemy casualties. Corporal Stowers' conspicuous gallantry Extraordinary heroism and supreme devotion to his men were well above and beyond the call of duty. Follow the finest traditions of military service and reflect the utmost credit on him and the United States Army. Signed, George Bush. Might, I think that concludes the service, but I'd like to ask the Vice President, Secretary of Defense, and General Vono and General Powell to come up and uh, thank our recipients, and maybe the other members of the Joint Chiefs would join us. I think it would be most appropriate. You've been listening to uh, Joe DeGuardi, uh, who has given his life for work in this uh, nation and in the world. You are not just a humanitarian for America. You, you are an international uh, work uh, person, and in, in incredible work that you've done. I got to ask you this. Um, Barack Obama became president because he was a community activist, quote unquote. You are out there working in the community. You're an, you're an activist. You are, you're a humanitarian. You, you invest in your whole heart, mind, and soul into this great work uh, in America and, and beyond. Uh, I know that you, that you feel comfortable in what you're doing. You're a CPA. And, but I, with your, your experience of being a CPA, I think the people would like to know, when are you coming back to take the ham, Joe, to get back into the, the real guts of things to help this nation to get back on track with your experience. Levi, that question comes up a lot. Let me tell you, there's a big difference in being a good congressman and running for Congress. Two different worlds. You have no idea the shenanigans that go on in campaigns. If I decided to run, I would have to take on someone who's been in office 20 years, 
who's now got not only seniority, but it's on one of the biggest uh, committees in Congress doling out money. Now, in a way, I think that would be good because I would then have a national platform with a person who has had more earmarks than probably anybody else in Congress and complain about the level of spending. But locally, people like the benefits of that spending. So I'd have to be very careful with that. Uh, but the point is that it would be very difficult for someone out of the box to go after someone that's been in there 20 years. That being said, I did it in effect in 1984 when no one thought Dick Ottinger could be beat. I announced against him, but little did I know six months later he was going to resign, retire, and that would become an open seat. So it made my job a bit easier. Could that happen again? Maybe. Uh, would I do it? The door's not closed to it. But I would like to see a partnership with people of like minds. If people really feel they need me to be a voice for the things that we just spoke about and some other things uh, that I would want to do in terms of fiscal responsibility, public accountability, good governance, the truth in government, these are the things that I've stood for all my professional life and, and in my public life before, during Congress and after. Uh, I would like to see a committee of people saying, Joe, you know, you're the kind of guy that should run. We know it's going to be difficult, but we want you to run. And we'll be standing around you in that press conference saying that we asked you to run. And I've said that to a number of people. Now, it's too early to make a decision, but the election is 2010. And if I decide to do it, that decision would have to be made right after the local elections that are happening in Westchester County on November the 4th or 5th, I believe. Uh, and as I said, I'm open-minded to it, but I want to be sure that uh, I'm not going to be a general without an army, right. you know? Uh, and it would be fun. I, I like campaigning. I like public affairs. Uh, and I've accomplished, as you can see, some interesting things doing it. So let's say that maybe God is not finished with me yet. Yes. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Uh, that was a say that was given by, I think it was uh, Reverend Jackson that said that. But I recall another saying that got me into the issue of the Congressional Medals of Honor for black war heroes. And it's one that I used when people asked me, why is this important? I said, well, let's go back to what Martin Luther King said. He said, if there is injustice anywhere, justice is threatened everywhere. And that always stuck with me. And I was a congressman when that holiday was declared. And when I had to give my speech as a new congressman in a very heavily populated African-American community, I studied a lot about Martin Luther King. And that one stuck with me. And there is an historic injustice here. And it still is with us because even though one medal was issued in 1991 and seven more in 1996, there should be probably dozens more if we did it the right way. In fact, the excuse that the military has used about World War I, because I'm still trying to get a medal for Sergeant Henry Johnson. That's what started this thing for me. He was from New York. Their excuse was that, number one, the files were lost. Number two, that uh, even though he got the highest award in France, the Croix de Guerre, that doesn't necessarily equate to the highest award here. Now, interestingly enough, we now have an African-American president. And one of the things I raised in the office just a few days ago of Congressman John Lewis was the fact that this may be the time to correct this historic injustice and rather than just go back to everyone that just got the second highest award, let's go back to that contingent of, uh, of, 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 army, uh, so, of army heroes in World War I that got France's highest award and let's say, hey, you know, we've done so many things for giving people this. Now we're going to have another resolution on, on slavery for, for the apologizing for slavery. It just passed the Senate this week. Uh, not that it includes reparations. And I think that's being done because we have Barack Obama as president. And I know that my good friend John Lewis can call Barack Obama. So I hope I've inspired him now to make that call and bug the military a bit the way I've been bugging them all these years. Let's hope it works. Let's hope, let's hope it works. One other point. The economy is now the big deal. Uh, it seems that we should have the concept that everyone should own a home if they want. I remember in the 50s, 
uh, coming from the black community, e we were poor. Uh, they call it abject poverty. Uh, yes. We were very poor. In outdoor toilet, outdoor plumbing, everything. But we owned our own home. Everybody in that neighborhood owned their own home. And we're very proud of it. Yes. And we were poor, but we owned a. Somehow, it seemed like after the revolution of the 60s, people wanted to call, move on up to the east side, the high deluxe department in the sky, high, high, you, know, you heard that. But what happened was we built projects and people moved out of the communities where they own homes into projects. And then somehow we lost the value of a community structure yes. and now we have gangs and so forth and so on, all these things. We concentrated people in an area that they became vulnerable to the ills of a city, and that's what happened, I believe, with these so-called uh, projects. Uh, and that's now being undone. Uh, uh, around the country, you can see us knocking down a lot of these very tall buildings and replacing them with one, two, three, four, five-story houses uh, to recreate that kind of community. Listen, home ownership is American. Home ownership gives you pride. Uh, the problem we had in the last few years with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac is that we had social engineering. Uh, we had congressmen saying, you know what, it's our policy that everybody should have a home. And what they did is they dumbed down the requirement so that even if you didn't have a job, people got a mortgage. Or if they had a job, didn't have enough income, they said, we don't need to see your income statement. Now, when did we ever do that before? And when did we ever give a mortgage out that with less than 20% equity? I mean, that's been the traditional standard. Well, in many of these mortgages, there was no equity. So, and then when values went down, in fact, they were counting on values going up. So when the economy turned, a lot of people were stuck with property worth less than what they borrowed. Now, this is the toxic, these are the toxic mortgages everybody's talking about that we're still writing off. And they, they're well over a trillion dollars worth. That's what brought uh, Lehman Brothers under and Bear Stearns. So we have to go back and recalibrate this kind of good intention that we want everybody in the house. You can't put people in homes that they can't afford. We first have to get them an education, like my father and mother gave me. Gateway to opportunity is education. And through education, you get a better job. Once you have a good job and a history, you're entitled to buy a house, have a mortgage, and pay it off, and have personal security in doing so. Without a good education, you will be handicapped right. in America. There is no question about it. My parents came here, and they didn't speak English very well from Italy. So I had to go to a good school to be sure that I spoke well enough so that I could evolve into a partner in a big accounting firm and then go to Congress. And the fruits of that are now evident. At 68, I look back on my life, and I say that it was all You're beautiful 68. Yeah, well, you, 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 you look great, you look like- It runs in my family, amazing. I think. But, you know, it's amazing. My mother, when she was 85, she looked like she was 65. But when she hit 90, she started to age. And by 94, she was gone. So. By that time, it's okay. <laughs> well, Joe, this has been quite an honor for me to have this opportunity to sit here and talk. Well, we went you. far away from the Congressional Medals of Honor deserved, for Black War Heroes. It deserved but. it, because you are, not, you are a great, hero yourself. And I feel that when people, the part of the kingmaker is, uh, talks about the unsung heroes, and you are indeed a kingmaker uh, in the work that you've been doing and Thank still you. doing, uh, and, and this nation should know more about you, and I hope through this interview we can do so. And uh, all of you who have the opportunity to get to know uh, Joe, please do so on his website, which we'll be announced, and I thank you so much for this great opportunity. Great. Thank you. Thank you.